Well, hello everybody. Welcome back to the Czech blog. I am here, here being in Cape Town, South Africa, talking to Jator Pierre, our good friend Jator. Uh, how are you, Jator? I'm in Timbuktu this morning, so <laughs> apparently that's, I don't know where that is. My mom used to say where we're going is Timbuktu, so <laughs> apparently it's a place somewhere out there. It is. I think it's actually Ethiopia, and I'm pretty sure you're not there. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that sounds like a place I wouldn't be right now. <laughs> no. And I see you've got your, uh, your special specs on again. Yeah, I, I've, you know, I've come to the conclusion that, uh, you know, uh, Clark Kent, Superman, Bruce Banner, the Hulk, um, uh, who else we got? Other superheroes have their alternative um, identities. This yeah. is my alternative identity. And someone in um, Facebook put, um, which I really loved on my new website, put uh, instead of the Incredible Hulk, they mm. put the Credible Hulk. <laughs> and the Hulk was wearing glasses, <laughs> and I'm I'm a huge Hulk fan, so that was pretty awesome. So this is my nice. you know alternate universe, uh, the uh, intellectual part of Jator. Uh, gotcha. We'll see about that. You know, it's that, a bit more uh, playful, weird, strange. Yeah. Well, I was gonna say we'll move on here in a second, but I was gonna say you know when when uh, superheroes put their glasses on in their secret identity, like, nobody can recognize them, right? So does this mean when you take yes. them off, I'm not going to recognize you as Jator? <laughs> that's right, that's right. And I think, you know, I usually play the Hulk in real life, so this is my, you know, Bruce Banner is my alternate ego. All right. <laughs> okay, to the serious stuff, though. Um, so, so in our last interview, we talked about goal setting, and you, you set out some really great uh, steps to to set goals. And and I, you know, I hope all of our listeners and viewers are giving some of those a try, or kind of stewing over them, meditating on them, because it's really good stuff there. But we, you raised some some really great questions at the end, ones that we didn't have get have time to address. But I, I wanted to come back, circle back, and talk about those because. Um, you know, I think for anybody who's really serious about setting goals and, you know, figuring out what their purpose is that, you know, these questions are worth asking. And so just kind of as a refresher, um, it, we were talking about self-sabotage, sabotage at the end of the last interview and, um, you know, uh, trying to get at how, uh, figure out the ways in which we as individuals sabotage our, our own goals. And so, you know, you propose that people ask, I wonder why I set goals and why I sabotage them. And so I'm wondering if you could talk today a little bit more about, you know, particularly this roadblock to, to achieving your goals, mm -hmm. you know, self-sabotage. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, the first thing that kind of comes up for me around self-sabotage is the question, what you just asked, why do we self-sabotage? Mm -hmm. And to be honest, that there's no particular answer to that question, right? There's, there's an infinite amount of answers to that question. However, some kind of roots of self-sabotage, at least that I've found uh, in my own life and in my client's life is uh, kind of you know, my perspective on a lot of this is looking back into our childhood and looking back into how we were, you know, what we saw as outside modeling, uh, how we met our parents' needs uh, is a pretty interesting question to ask. And said, and, and said in another way, uh, had we learned to parent our parents, yeah. uh, which is an interesting question to ask, um, which can be really triggering for a lot of people. I, I, I didn't parent my parents. and mm. I don't parent my significant other. Mm. Uh, my perspective on that is if you're triggered, <laughs> you can probably do it. <laughs> yes. So yay for us. <laughs> um, uh, so, you know, with that being in mind of our childhood and looking back to self-sabotage, it's, it's essentially like, how did we learn to get our emotional needs met by playing ourselves small? Uh, mm. can easily be a question to be asked. Uh, when we look at, um, the the neediness of the human being uh when we're born we're extremely needy we're extremely needy of the outside world food warmth 
safety, security, protection, all of those things are there as soon as you're born. And in my perspective, the human being, myself included, uh, maybe those needs become less and less and less. However, uh, there's still a large amount of neediness inside of us that uh, most of us, in my experience, deny that we're needy. And b through that denial of our neediness, for me, accentuates our unresolved neediness behavior. Uh, and the more needy that we become uh, unconsciously, the more that shows up in our lives and through this, the lens of self-sabotage then, if we're not aware of our own neediness and we're needy of the external world, but we're unaware of it, mm. we will essentially start to self-sabotage our experience of the outside world to deny our neediness, essentially. Mm. Um, and that's super fascinating. It doesn't make any sense, which I love. Um, I really love looking at mental and emotional behaviors as not really having a logical mm. sense to them because it's emotion. And for me, uh, emotion doesn't necessarily make a whole lot of sense. So we're extremely needy. We deny our neediness. <clears throat> uh, we saw our parents model how they move throughout life. Uh, mm. So let's just see, let's say that we saw our, our dad or our mom go through self-sabotage behavior or self-sabotage in relationship. Mm. Um, we'll learn that as behaviors and we'll implement those behaviors as kind of our internal programming of, of the outside world. So we have this external programming, seeing our parents and society modeling the behavior of self-sabotage, which essentially just means shooting ourselves in the foot. Mm. Partly because if there's these unconscious aspects of self that got our needs met mm. by not reaching our goals, then there's a part of self that will always shoot ourselves in the foot to bring us back to what we're familiar with. Mm. So we're needy of self-sabotage because we're unaware that self-sabotage and our neediness fit together quite tightly. And I imagine in that case too, right, um, you're getting some reward, some benefit in a way out of self-sabotaging, right? Because that's how you get the attention of your mom or your spouse or your friends or whatever. Oh my God. I mean, you know, one of the examples that I love that I think a lot of people can kind of tap into because this stuff, when we're listening to this kind of, a, kind of talk, a lot of us will disassociate. And, mm. and we'll sit there and like, what the hell is he saying? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Even parts of me will do that. What am I saying? <laughs> because parts of our ego get so threatened by this information. Mm. It's like we have to disassociate from it because from my perspective, the ego uh, needs control. Yeah. And this type of diving into yourself represents loss of control to the ego. Mm. So we'll become very confused and disassociated. In them. Mm. Wait, what did he just say? Mm. Um, so can you repeat what you just said so I can remember? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so there's a, a kind of reinforcement of the neediness ah. because when you um, when you do self sabotage, you you get a reward, right? You get attention from whoever it is, right? If you're a child, then it's from maybe from your mom or your dad, or uh, you know, or if you're married, then it might be from a spouse. Or but but there's this kind of um, reinforcement of the behavior from some kind of reward. Yeah, reward. Yeah, the attention. Uh, thanks for bringing me back to uh, uh, my awareness of self, James. <laughs> um, it's a tough yeah. So job. The, re the reward, the reward piece. <laughs> Yeah. It's so fascinating to me, and I think a lot of people connect to this kind of metaphor. Is just imagine a, a child at home, and let's say one of the parents stays home, one of the parents works, whether that's the mom or dad is irrelevant, just one parent stays home, or both parents go to work. Yeah. So both parents go to work, this is kind of normal society, and uh, the kid gets sick, and the kid gets sick and notices that mom or dad stays home, Mm. when he or she is sick. Yeah. And to the psychology, the kid says, ah, wow, when I am sick, I get attention. 
Mm. To the child, to the mind of a child, attention simply equals love. Mm. Okay, so that gets kind of downloaded. Kid gets sick again a few months later. Wow, mom or dad stays home again. Yeah. That gets downloaded more and more. Over time, that may become a behavior pattern where that kid unconsciously learns that when they're sick, they get attention. Mm. That may grow into not only when I'm sick, but when I'm um, not basically playing the victim role, I get a lot of attention. I get attention from the outside world. I get to, uh, people feel sorry for me. People mm. want to take care of me. Uh, people want to give me advice. People want to parent me, mm. whether that's my parents parenting me, my friends parenting me, or my significant other parenting me. Mm. And I associate that unconsciously with love and attention. So I continue to do that throughout my life. So how this ties back into creating a purpose or creating a dream mm. is if this is unconscious aspects of self, mm. we may self-sabotage our purpose, our dream, our goals, etc., so that we can facilitate the story of not achieving those things and therefore getting attention from the outside world for not achieving. Mm. Whether again, usually this stops being our parents if they're still in your, if they're not in your life anymore. Right, right. And it becomes a significant other mm. or it becomes your friends and family. Mm. If you're unaware of that and you're unaware of that familiarity and the attention that we gain from that self-sabotage, we may continue to do that for the rest of our lives. Yeah. So we may have this part of self that says, wow, my purpose is dot, 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 dot. And unconsciously underneath that, there's another part of you or many other parts of you shaking their head. Mm -mm. If you change this behavior, you're not going to get the attention that you've always gotten in the mm. ways that you've always gotten it. Mm. That is extremely scary to our ego. Or mm. our ego parts. Yeah. Maybe said in another way, uh, a metaphor and imagery that I really like is: imagine that you're standing at the the highest tower in your city, and you have this. You're in the penthouse essentially, and you have this global kind of glass all around you, so you can see the entire city, mm -hmm. and you know all the streets, you know all the buildings. Uh, you know your city very well. Let's say this is the city that you grew up in. Being in that top tall tower and being in this knowing space and knowing the city that you're in represents all of the things that are familiar to you and mm -hmm. represents how you self-identify, what you're attached to, your friends and family, everything that helps you feel like you have some feet on the ground, mm -hmm. right? So you feel grounded and safe. Doing this type of work for the ego Diving into your kind of shadow, diving into what's unconscious, changing those things is like standing in that same tower and taking one building and uprooting that building at a time. Mm. So yeah, I know where that building is. Nope, I don't anymore. That's gone. Mm. That street's gone. My favorite taco shop's gone. <laughs> my favorite paleo shop's gone. Mm. Uh, you know, my favorite place to buy all of these things. All that's gone. So you're essentially... Uh, dissolving the city that you can see around you. Mm. Can you imagine standing in a building in a city that you feel very comfortable in and literally watching the city disappear in front of your eyes? Can you imagine the amount of fear that one would feel? Yeah. yeah. As a metaphor, that's the same amount of fear that we'll feel trying to go through the change process because it's unfamiliar and it's unsafe. Mm. You're taking away the things that make you feel safe and comfortable. Right. And the, yeah. the, the paradox of that is the things that make us feel safe and comfortable aren't always good things. Right, right. There aren't the things that, you know, um, self-sabotage and literally and figuratively shooting yourself in the foot and ruining your goals, dreams, etc. That can be so familiar and your addiction to kind of the shame and guilt that you feel from that self-sabotage can be so sweet. 
mm-hmm. to a part of you because it feels so powerful through that mechanism that you won't change it. Mm. It's the same, like same idea of, uh, you know, maybe in the, in kind of the personal training world, uh, you have a client that comes to you and says, I want to lose weight. Mm. If you watch the client's behavior, they're saying, I want to lose weight. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They're saying it, yeah. but there's so much attachment to what that weight represents to them. that that's a very hard process to go through unless we become aware of why that weight's there, what it represents to them, what needs are being met by having that weight, how they feel safe and secure through it. Yeah. Otherwise, they will just sabotage, 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 because right. you know, there's another look at this uh, from my own life going through kind of body transformation from the time I was 15 to now and noticing my own desire to self-sabotage. There are moments when I would look in the mirror going through this change and I didn't know who I was. Mm. I would look in the mirror and the image that I saw wasn't the image that I had. Yeah. That is scary as hell. Mm. Mm. I would literally sometimes see that image change so much. Who is that? Yeah. So I'd go and, you know, I don't know, eat a bunch of bananas and (laughs) and almond butter and and, then, To get myself, you know, going back the other way Mm. and at other times self-sabotaging in other ways, whether Mm. it was, you know, a healthy food or, uh, or even maybe inviting an injury into my life, which Mm. is an interesting, you know, idea, Mm -hmm. uh, maybe inviting a a disease or a sickness or not feeling well into Mm. my life, Mm -hmm. kind of these more subtle ways of sabotage that we don't, we just associate with like these things just happen to us. Right. I'm fascinated by the consideration of, wow, could me playing hockey and dislocating my shoulder when I'm going after certain goals be an unconscious way that I self-sabotage to inhibit my process? Yeah. I mean, that fascinates me. Whether it's true or not is irrelevant. It's, it's an exploration of self. Well, and, and I, I want to touch on that because um, a, a lot of what we've been talking about here, I think people believe that we all have some perfectly transparent and 100% access and accurate access to who we are as people. Um, I, I think people think, right? You'll hear people say, I, 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 agree. I know myself, I, agree. I know who I am, I know, you know, and, and, and one of the you know, really big points that, that you're bringing up is that um, you have to get to know who you are, right? There are parts of you that are operating, well, subconsciously, right? And that means, in a way, they're, you are not conscious of their operations. You don't know what they are doing um, directly. And so you have to explore who you are, explore, you know, what your past was, what your motivations are, what, what these subconscious urges and needs are. Um, you have to, you have to do exploration on yourself. I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, you know, the fascinating question for me <clears throat> that you brought up is who am I? Yeah. And literally, you know, I could sit here and say, yeah, James, I'm, a Czech practitioner. I'm uh, in. I do functional medicine. Uh, I practice gut health. Uh, those are all self identifications. Mm. Yeah. Those are all p- parts of who I am. Yeah. I I honestly don't know who I am. Mm-hmm. I have a lot of ideas. Mm-hmm. I have you know the grandest ideas that I have are I am God. I am higher source. I am, you know, what flows through me. Uh, I am all of these kind of like kind of spiritual ideas that I think are awesome Mm -hmm. and cool to explore. And then I have kind of my more practical, grounded human Mm -hmm. ideas of who I am, what I do. I mean, even asking the question, when I ask this question in classes, I say, you know, introduce who you think you are. And what I find fascinating about language is a lot of people will say, I am Jator, or I am James, Mm -hmm. or I am Ben, or I am uh, Sal, Mm -hmm. right? 
the interesting piece about that language is I am then a name mm. rather than my name is Jator. My name is James. So by saying I am, you're mm. immediately completely identifying with that. That is who you are mm. rather than that's simply just your name. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's not yeah, you, yeah, yeah. it's yeah. your name. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, we yeah. do this all the time. So you know, I'm a very curious person, and for me, it's a it's a grander question to ask. Who am I? Yeah. What are my self identifications? How do I identify self? Yeah. Uh, and maybe who am I not? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. kind of learning who I am by learning who I'm not. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. Apparently, I'm not my body. It's my body. Well, that means at some level, something just floating through this body that is me, okay? I'm apparently not my thoughts. I'm not my emotions. Um, I'm not even my perceptions. Whoa. Yeah. Are those all just pieces and parts of who I experience myself to be? And then ultimately, who am I? And I love this question, which is, um, you know, who is the unwatched watcher? And for me, that is a deep, deep question. And I think part of what we're exploring here is then, as you're exploring these things, these deeper questions, at least for me, you're also exploring, okay, how you self-identify, how you get your needs met emotionally. And then that helps you to find why you may be self-sabotaging, uh, why you might be really excellent at doing certain things and really, in quotes, challenge doing other things. Because you can stem this back to your childhood um, and and tap into that. Uh, as a fascinating idea around that, a lot of us self-sabotage because as children, the 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 innocence that we had, the the grandness that we had, the connection, the source that we had. We may have interpreted that as uh, intimidating or too beautiful for the outside world to handle. Mm -hmm. Our parents, in particular, or we may have been shamed for sharing those aspects of self. So. Uh, as an example, you know, a little kid says, Mom, I see, you know, beautiful angels and, um, I, I don't know, guides, etc. And if that parent then says, no, you don't. Yeah. What are you talking about? That's impossible. The kid interprets that as some level of shame and then inhibits that side of self. That kid may self-sabotage for the rest of his or her life simply out of fear of the shame that they felt in that moment in regards to what their parents said and how they experienced their parents' words mm -hmm. and never wanting to fully expose themselves again. So the kid essentially become, leaves innocence and becomes naive. Innocence for me is very uh, childlike, so imaginative, curious, open, uh, fun, playful. Uh, and then naivety becomes child ish behavior. So we're naive, we don't know, and we don't want to know. Mm. So we become angry, defensive, walled off, and we don't want to look. Mm. Mm -hmm. So for me to get beyond maybe uh, and into why we self-sabotage is inviting in our innocence and our curiosity and our childlike playfulness rather than sticking to our naivete and our walls, um, and our childish behavior. Another way to say it is, watch a, a, a two-year-old in the sandbox and watch their behavior, or, or not even a sandbox, just outside. They're, mm. Mom, why is the sky blue? Why is the sand like this? This mm -hmm. is just beautiful kind of imaginative behavior. And then we contrast that with a teenager. Mm -hmm. Typical teenager, I know everything, you can't tell me anything, and I'm very blocked off. Mm. And how many of us don't ever leave that teenage behavior? I, <laughs> I would say it's parts of me included. Mm. You know, I wouldn't be able to see this if, if, I, if it wasn't parts of me that I've explored in myself. Mm. 
Yeah, so that's great. And, and so just to kind of bring this back to what prompted this, because we sort of, you know, <laughs> meandered a lot, and it's been <laughs> fascinating. But, you know, the, the question is, you know, so so let, let's put it really simply, right? So we know sometimes people have a hard time achieving goals. So the question is why? Why do people have such a challenge achieving goals and they're achieving their goals? And, and so we're talking about self-sabotage as... As, mm -hmm. as that uh, you know, as as that one of the major sources of that, one of the reasons why why we don't achieve, um, and uh, yeah, there's a lot lot to go on there, and and so so bring it back to to one of the questions that you um, had posed in the last uh, the last interview as well. That's related to this. You, you know, so the place to start for somebody right might be to say, if I had to guess, where did I learn this behavior of, of self sabotage? Right mm -hmm. and um, and and you kind of as a as a as a adjunct to that like what what good is the value of a guess right um, uh, yeah and so so talk a little bit about those two questions you know if I you know why is that a good place to start and um, yeah how do you answer the question what good is it to guess yeah um, <clears throat> great place to start for me uh, is with guessing. Um, why? Well, there's a couple reasons. For me, guessing immediately kind of invites in uh, your heart into the situation. It invites in the, the, the childlike behavior, not the childish behavior. So the curiosity, mm -hmm. the imagination, the exploration. Mm -hmm. So that's one piece. Uh, imagination's extremely underrated, by the way. As I think a lot of us in the Czech world has, have heard, mm. uh, you can find amazing chunks of, of truth for yourself through the imagination process and allowing that. So mm. that is a piece of it. Kind of a more practical uh, piece of it for me from a kind of psychological perspective is, you know, we have these, the ego is essentially like this protective mechanism that we have. And it protects us from trauma and or issue that is overwhelming to us. Mm -hmm. So in my perspective, we definitely remember everything. You remember even down to the moment of conception. Mm -hmm. However, you may not recall everything. So that mm -hmm. piece that not being able to recall is kind of how the ego protects you from this information to slowly let it out over your life or invite you to check it out and look into it. Almost like a if I had a big hot air balloon right here, that would represent all of the, the experiences of my life that I experienced maybe as traumatic. Mm. And what we're doing here is kind of like opening that balloon, just eking out a little bit through our lives, right? Like, mm. and letting more and more out. If we let all that out at one singular time, that would overwhelm the system. Mm. And my guess would be that you would die on the spot. If you were exposed to all of who you are and all of your traumas in one singular moment, mm -hmm. my guess would be that would completely overwhelm the nervous system mm -hmm. and you'd die. Mm -hmm. So there's a protective piece to this. So the guess, uh, I imagine the guess as parts of our ego being kind of like these pit bulls. And when we start to think into ourselves, these pit bulls will raise their heads up and show their teeth. Mm. And essentially they're saying, mm -mm, mm. we don't get to go there yet. So you mm. won't be able to remember and you won't be able to recall, my, mm. my apologies, you won't be able to recall the information that you're searching for by looking and mm. thinking into it mm -hmm. because these pit bulls are there to protect that, that mm. information. When you use a guess, in my experience what happens is the pit bulls see a guess and they say, that's so silly. You're just being a silly little kid. What are you going to gain from a guess? That's irrelevant. You're not going to gain anything from a stupid guess. Pitbull says, ah, oh, go to sleep, Pitbull. Mm -hmm. And that opens up then to your intuition. Mm -hmm. That opens up to your heart. That opens up to feeling into this. So the guess essentially lulls some of these protective mechanisms to sleep because we deem it as silly, stupid, and irrelevant to the adult protective parts of us, they go to sleep and that opens us up to beautiful information. 
Um, you know, I do this all the time in my own work with myself, and I do it with clients, and I am shocked and amazed and floored on a daily basis when I invite someone to guess into something. Well, if you had to guess, the stuff that comes up for people is memories that they haven't thought about in 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Mm -hmm. And they, through that guess, and they get whoa, 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 all this vibration of the memory and the experience and what happened. And, oh, man, I, wow, could that be a root of why I uh, behave and move through life now? Is that something that I learned when I was a kid? That was a survival mechanism that served me beautifully then and is no longer serving me now. Mm. And that's the beauty of a guess is that for me, it opens your heart up and it opens your intuition up. Mm -hmm. uh, in, our, in my experience with a lot of this work, um, we're overly heady. Mm. We got to think our way into it. Mm. For me, that is the fastest way to get lost is trying to think your way into emotion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I almost think, for me, that's laughable, mm -hmm. <laughs> in my opinion. Um, I guess, you know, it occurs to me that, you know, if you're trying to explore, um, uh, say, your neediness, right, that's, that's a way of self-sabotaging, right, this, this neediness that you have. Um, I, I guess I wonder whether, how to, how to ask this, um, whether by guessing you what you end up doing in some ways is um, nurturing that neediness rather than mm. getting at the the source of it to, or really understanding it so you can move past it. I love that. I love that idea. Um, it definitely feels nurturing to me. Mm. It feels nurturing of, of the little boy that's in me, the imagination that's in me, the mm -hmm. The, the neediness that's in me, mm. the fear that's in me, the vulnerability that's in me, the shame that's in me, the guilt that's in me, the anger that's in me. Um, there's a, a saying that I've heard that for me, I, I, I pretty much wholeheartedly believe, which is what we resist persists. Mm. If we're resisting our shame, if we're resisting our neediness, if we're resisting our anger, uh, if we're trying to numb those things out, for me, that stuff persists at a very deep level that we're unaware of it. Mm. It's so deep, we essentially numb it out again mm -hmm. and deny it. Yeah. Um, my experience of being a human being is I have a spectrum of feelings. Yeah. And my experience of, of a lot of what people call spirituality today, uh, I... I honestly have a different opinion. Uh, for me, a lot of what I see as deemed as spirituality today is deny your humanness. Mm -hmm. Deny that you have feelings and present yourself as extremely Zen. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't agree with that. Mm -hmm. I think spirituality is embracing all of yourself and feeling into all of your feelings and that they're all necessary and that they're all there to share something with you beautiful. Uh, you know, we kind of project onto Buddha and, and Jesus, etc. At least in my experience, people project onto them that they were just always Zen and always balanced. Mm -hmm. That's BS. Mm -hmm. They were human beings too. And we can make some pretty strong arguments about their unconscious needs and how they move through their life to get their needs met by presenting themselves in a certain way. I mean, it, it, that fascinates me. So for me, spirituality is simply allowing yourself to be who you think you are and exploring all of your feelings, all of your emotions, and embracing that rather than trying to present yourself as that and shutting that all down and denying it. Mm. It's there. Yeah. And if you don't think it is, in my experience, there's a word for that. It's called denial. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, uh, another question, you know, anyway, we could do these, these, these talks for hours and hours. I, but one, one <laughs> I, I, and maybe this will be our last question for this interview, um, but one, one other thing that uh, occurs to me, right, that, that it seems to me that, that if you, if you, um, kind of want to get something out of these explorations that you're having. It seems to me like humility 
is is a requirement, mm -hmm. right? That is that um, just an openness to whatever comes out of these explorations, mm -hmm. right? Rather than a um, a, a knee jerk sort of reaction to say, well, that that's not that's not me. Uh, that neediness, mm -hmm. not, that's not really me. That's, I don't know what that is, you know, um, but it's not me, right? So you, there yeah. needs to be this sort of humility, right, about about these explorations. Yeah, I would agree. I think I would use a different word mm -hmm. um, only because I have an attachment to that word, humility. Mm -hmm. um, my attachment to that word is that it comes with some of this vibrancy of shame attached to it. Mm -hmm. um, for me, it would be humbleness. Mm -hmm. Could I be humble to to what I don't know? Mm. Could I be humble to what flows through me? Could I be humble to the gray and the not knowing? And mm. could I be curious? It's not even saying we are this or we aren't that. It's simply mm. saying, could I be curious? Mm. You know, as an example, uh, in in arg like let's say if I'm in an argument um, with someone that I'm intimate with or close to. And let's say that person says, and this has literally occurred, the person said to me, uh, you know, I'm experiencing you as being really passive aggressive right mm. now. And in that moment, I paused mm. and I checked in with myself and I said, hmm, I'm really curious. Am I being passive aggressive right now? Yeah. Check in, check in. And I was like, oh my, I am. And I said, you know what? You're right. Mm -hmm. I, I am being passive aggressive right now. And mm -hmm. I didn't notice it. And thank you for bringing my awareness to it, which me is a, a form of humbling myself and being vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Where most, in my experience, most interactions would have gone like, uh, you know, you're being passive aggressive right now. And I'd be like, what are you talking about? I'm not being passive aggressive. You're being aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> there's no vulnerability and humbleness and just like wait huh. yeah yeah maybe i am being that and let me be curious about it and another way to look at it is uh you know what i don't feel like i'm being passive aggressive right now mm -hmm. i'm curious if i am let me sit with that for a while and i'll come back at a, at a later yeah. time and, and, and explore it with you because yeah. right now I don't feel it, but it, it could be there, and I'm just unaware of it. Yeah. Uh, and maybe, you know, here's, here's maybe another way to think about it. Because I, I tend to be a little bit more left-brained, right? A little bit, I think that's right. More sort of mathematical, <laughs> logical, right? I always get these left yeah. and right. I'm, I'm brain dyslexic. Um, <laughs> uh, but, but because I'm that more rational, I tend to, tend to think, think of it this way, right? So, or it seems to me maybe this is kind of in line with what you're saying, is that um, um, learning about yourself is like theory building as a scientist, right? We build this theory mm -hmm. of, who, I build mm -hmm. this theory of who I am. And these explorations uh, that we're talking about are opportunities to gather more data, right? So that you can, as a scientist, a scientist of yourself, um, confirm your hypothesis or maybe find out that your working hypothesis isn't quite right. And to make adjustments, right? To to adjust your theory in the, in the face of data. And as, as, as a good scientist will say, you know, you, you have to always be open to the possibility that your theories are wrong. That's part of science. And that's the humbleness mm -hmm. that, that you were mm -hmm. talking about. Uh, I'm just gonna call you Babe Ruth right now. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome yeah. I'm taking that one home thanks James <laughs> <laughs> you got it <laughs> uh, yeah well that this has been really um, as always eye opening um, uh, Jatora I, I, these, especially the, this discussion you know, of, of self-sabotage you know, all, we, this time of year January is always we always focus on goal setting and you know, I, think it's, mm -hmm. I think it's good and I think it's worth it even though you know, it's sort of artificially imposed by our sort of New Year's blah 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 junk mm -hmm. but it's, mm -hmm. I'm glad that we have an, a reason to touch base on this because you know, mm -hmm. we, like we talked about in the last interview it's, it's super important to have a purpose and goals. As Paul likes to say, what is, what is it saying? Um, if you don't have a destination, any road will get you there. Um, yeah. 
<laughs> and it may be a really bumpy and <laughs> kind of uncomfortable <laughs> yeah. ride, right? Yeah. Um, so, so you know, having a purpose, having a goal is one way of shaping your life and taking control of it and making what you want out of it. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. And, um, and as a paradox to that, because mm -hmm. I'm a contrarian. <laughs> yes, um, you are. <laughs> is um hey as an offering for all of us you know even if you're on purpose on dream mm. uh, that doesn't mean it's not going to be a bumpy road yeah. it simply means that you're going to work yourself through the bumps because you have that purpose and you have your dream and you have that motivation so that gives you some gas in your tank to be like you know what yeah. i can top this off and hit the gas and and, and deal with this yeah. um, and work my way through it and if I need to, I can hire a coach or hire somebody outside of me who's been through similar things yeah. uh, to help guide the process. Uh, yeah. you know, I personally have three coaches, and I think uh, we all wear blinders, and I think mm -hmm. a sign of a good coach, in my opinionated opinion, is that you have a coach. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's great advice. Um, so, so I think we're going to cut it there, but, but I want to, in our next, uh, in, in our next talk, uh, in our next interview, I want to talk about something else that we discussed at the end of the first uh, the first discussion of goals, which is, um, I don't know whether it was you or I raised the question, how do I know when my purpose is my purpose? Um, yeah, and, and I like that question in part because, uh, you know, you, you, you uh, drew our attention to the idea that at the top of this sort of structure of goals and purpose you build, you know, if you've got the right purpose there, then, uh, as, as you said this, and it really stuck with me, that the individual goals, when they're properly aligned with your, your purpose, they feel like opportunity. Uh, mm. I thought that was a really cool thing, a really you know, yeah, compelling yeah. thing that you said. Like, so um, getting that purpose right is so crucial to being able to achieve the day-to-day -day goals. So uh, let's talk about you know, how you know when you've figured out what, what really you know, your purpose is, is what you stumbled onto. Let's do it. All right, great. Two weeks. Two weeks. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Well, thanks so much, Jator. Uh, this, was, this was fantastic, and uh, can't wait to do our next session. All right. Thanks, James. Good to see you, brother. Likewise.